Um, all right, so uh, again, it is a sunny, beautiful Tuesday morning here in Seattle. Uh, today is July 14th at just after 9 a.m. And I have a special guest to introduce today who will be uh, participating. Uh, so I would like to quickly introduce you all to Jared Borner. Uh, Jared, would you like to say a few things about yourself? Hey, yeah, uh, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so I am a software engineer and I'm working on AppSheet specifically in regards to the charting capabilities. Um, so I'm really looking forward to working with the community and uh, making that a great experience for you all. Excellent. And uh, just for context, for those that have been around for a little bit of time, um, Jared has actually been with Google for just over two years, I think you mentioned, Jared, and he joined our team a few months ago to focus um, on this area as well as a few others. Um, so welcome, Jared. We're excited to have you not only on the team, but with us this morning. Uh, for those that I haven't had a chance to meet before or those that are new to AppSheet, uh, my name is Jennifer. I'm a product marketing manager that tends to host these webinars. Um, we are working from home still in the U.S. I always like to add that disclaimer because you never know if the internet's going to behave a little funny or if you hear some interesting background noise. My work from home co-host uh, is my dog, Roxy. Uh, you might hear her say a hello to you as well. And it looks like we have a special guest um, that just popped in. Uh, would you like to quickly say hello, Praveen? Yes, hi everybody, Praveen here. Been with AppSheet a while. Yeah, so um, Praveen uh, just made actually a really funny joke. He's the founder of AppSheet for those that are, are new to the platform. So uh, Praveen, welcome. Uh, excited to have you here today. All right. Uh, so really quickly, our agenda for today, uh, we're going to focus primarily on UX views and chart types as well as uh, dashboards. I did want to also address uh, some questions we've been receiving around white labeling. It's a really hot topic as of late, especially for those newer to the platform. So we'll answer some questions there, cover a couple of tips and tricks, and Q&A. Uh, Jared and Praveen, you ready to dig in? Let's do it. All right. All right. Uh, so a few quick announcements for all of you folks. Um, first and foremost, uh, we are going to add an additional webinar, office hours webinar session that is more APAC friendly. I personally will not be hosting that, but I am training a team to host that. So you will not have to stay up until 1 a.m. in the morning uh, to participate in these sessions. And we'll try to focus on content um, that is more helpful for your region as well. Um, we also are uh, going to modify the feature release notes we talked about in our last webinar session. Our goal had been to release those notes daily. We haven't been able to do that. So I've been working with our team. We'll be posting those notes twice a week starting today. And that should hopefully provide some more transparency and clar uh, clarity around that. And I apologize if it's caused any inconveniences for anyone that we've fallen behind on that a little bit, but do know that it's on our mind and, and we'll be moving forward with that today. Right. For those that are brand new to the platform or looking for a quick refresher, uh, we have our AppSheet community, which if you look in your, I believe, question box or chat box, there's a link for the post for today where you can post questions. But we do have a great uh, post within the community called Learn How to Use AppSheet. And within that post, you'll find 10 different resources that will help you onboard to the platform, including our AppSheet Academy, which is our 100 level training course. It's about 90 minutes, it's free, and it's a great way to onboard and learn more about how to get started quickly. For those that English is not your first language, uh, we do also have some great community submitted resources as well to help learn about the platform. So check out this link and we can certainly post it in our thread for today. But this is a great alternate resource. I think we have 14 languages covered right now in addition to English. So do give this a look, especially if you have customers in that particular region that you would like to help support with this as well. All right, so Jared and Praveen, um, now we're going to talk about UX view types and charts and dashboards. All right, so really quickly, uh, for those new to the platform, UX view type uh, is a really critical element to understand. It's how your data is displayed in your application for your end user. We have several different types, and as we've mentioned today, we're going to focus on charts and then quickly mention dashboards. 
Uh, it can aid in both collecting your data from your end user, as well as displaying how your data is consumed by your audience. We have 11 different types, um, which Praveen, I think this time last year we had eight. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it was less than 11. So yeah. some have been added. <laughs> yeah, so we, this is an area that we continue to add uh, to based on feedback. Uh, onboarding is another um, newer one too, so that's a, a good one to keep in mind. Um, applications can also have as few uh, view types or as many as you would like. So for example, you could have an application that's just a form, which would be one view type, or you could have one with you know, 15, 20 different view types if you like. You can even get as complex um, as adding view types within view types, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, Jen, can I jump in with a quick comment? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, for our customers attending this webinar, the way to think about the view types is just that um, normally, if you were a programmer and building an application, you'd have to lay out all of the specific, uh, they call them little widgets or controls on a view and do a lot of formatting and detail work to get something to look uh, exactly the way you want, right? And you have to repeat this for every single view you build. Um, that's how uh, programmers build applications. Um, since we are a no-code platform, we have the sort of observation that most applications, especially around the sort of domains that, you know, business domains, tend to have uh, one of these patterns. So effectively, the view types are pre-built patterns that get thought, you get to customize and configure, but your data fits into those patterns, and so it sort of presents itself well across different form factors. So that's what we're trying to do is take the programming out of having to build uh, these rich presentations. Thank you for that input, Praveen. And I would add um, one of the real benefits to that, in addition to you know not having to know code, is that it's very fast. You upload your data and you can get an application off the ground quickly. So it saves a lot of time, as well as a lot of programming related stressors, you could say. All right, so charts. Uh, Jared, this is going to be kind of um, your, your main uh, highlight for our webinar today. So just a, a quick note on charts. Um, you visually display data with a variety of chart options. There's a, a quick picture of the right here of the different types of charts that we have, and we'll touch on those in more depth in just a moment. Your charts can be a standalone chart, again, going back to the single view type of just one type of chart, or it can be within an additional view type, which would be a dashboard view type. Uh, we have improvements coming, which we're going to touch on in just a moment. And then I'm going to highly encourage you all to provide your feedback on charts. Uh, we're at a really great stage right now where we're taking feedback at a higher rate um, than normal. And so you'll be able to help influence um, what we're producing here. And Jared, I'm going to hand uh, this over to you for just a moment to showcase a little bit of what's coming. And then we'll dive deeper into um, charts at, at a deeper level. Awesome. All right. All right. So give me one second. No, you're okay. The the benefits of working from home, right? You get to have your own coffee, but you also have your own internet. So <laughs> it's not always the best of trade-offs sometimes. Okay, uh, Jennifer, I'm uh, I didn't set up fully, so I'm gonna have to quit uh, the the soft. They'll go to meeting software uh, okay. and relaunch to share. So maybe we just wanna. I'll continue yeah. on. Yep, I'm I'm happy to um, present what I have for all of you. All right, folks, give me just one moment while I take back control. All right, perfect. So I have here. Um, oh, and one one last thing I should mention. I already kind of gave it away. Um, but you folks that are on this call are are, are all excuse me going to get a sneak peek of a refresh we're doing for the editor right now as well. So things might look a little different than what you've been ex been used to experiencing. So um, congratulations maybe are in order. All right, so. Yeah, what's that? Is that our editor? <laughs> I don't know, Praveen. <laughs> uh, all right, so I have this app here and actually maybe we can start by just showcasing the app itself. It looks so fancy now. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to expand and show this in a uh, desktop view. All right, so here's a simple list view. If we go into our dashboard here, you can see that there's a chart in the bottom right hand corner. Um, we can expand this. And Jared, would you like to talk about a few of the updates that you've made to the chart uh, recently in terms of rendering and whatnot? Yeah, sure. So we've updated some of the rendering and some of the, the core improvements that uh, you should see is labeling. The uh, Currently, there's an issue if you have a lot of axes labels that they start overlapping and um, yeah, they just don't look good. So that should, there should be improvement there where they don't overlap as much. Uh, so the tooltip should be a bit improved and especially with uh, the legends, um, there'll be, a, especially with a pie charts a lot of times if you want to include the legend and there's a lot of different uh, legend entries it would it would just push off the actual pie chart uh, but now the uh, the legend's been improved so that you sh that shouldn't be an issue anymore and why don't we actually just go in and make one of these charts uh, a pie chart really quickly all right um, so Jared you were saying that the legends would be improved Do you want to talk a little bit more about um, legends and charting in general yeah, sure. Uh, if you uh, if you were to pull up a chart real quick, so basically the legend is all of the main dimensions that we break the chart down by, and essentially all it's doing is it's taking the data set and it's grouping it um, by some of field in that data set. Um, and so the legend usually shows uh, those those main entries that you're trying to break your data set down by and display. Very cool. Uh, and we'll show a pie chart in just a moment. Um, but thank you for that that overview, Jared. So in terms of how we navigated to where these charts live, um, as previously mentioned, it's a UX view type. So you want to find it under UX and views here. It's a little bit of an adjustment getting used to the new <laughs> layout. Uh, so make sure that your data is your table um, and your data set for this table is set to chart as the view type. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll have different chart options you can see here. And this might, okay, it did adjust. Um, so we have a couple of different view types we can select from. Jared, do you think pie chart, uh, since we were just talking about that, would be a good one to show? Yeah. All right. So let's click on pie chart here. Uh, this one might be an aggregate pie chart, I think. So it might be an aggregate. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. I think it was a histogram, and now I think it might be an aggregate. Okay. Aggregate let's... pie chart. Maybe pick a different one then. Um, Aggregate pie chart will show you the same behaviors that you want. It's true. Okay. Let's set these both to pie charts. That way, just in case one looks a little better than the other. All right. So click save to save our update. All right. Beautiful. Now let's just quickly reload this. And I think it uh, it actually dropped the column, Jennifer. So that's yeah. why you're not. Oh, seeing it dropped it. the column. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. Well. Yeah. Try aggregate pie chart, Jen. That should work fine. Yeah, and then you pick a column. All right there it is. Then you add a chart go. column. Right. There we go. May have to save it or something. See all of these, you get in the zone. <laughs> you get in the zone. All right, there we go. Now we should be able to display. One day, actually, it'll read your mind, but till then, you have to hit the save button. You know, I don't know if <laughs> that's a good or a bad thing right now. It might be a good thing. Okay, I think we did by region. Nope. Let's double check. Ah, there we go. All right. Um, so this is your new and improved pie chart. And as um, Jared was just discussing with the legend with the overlay here, Jared, is there anything else you'd like to add to that piece of it? Uh, piece of the pie, no pun no, intended? I think, I think the, uh, <laughs> the chart being a visualization kind of shows all of the, the high points. One thing uh, that you I can note is if you go back to the dashboard view, you'll actually see the uh, the pager. So on the on the the chart on the bottom right. So to page through the the legend entries. Mm. 
this is all user error, by the way. I just want to give that disclaimer to those that are on the call that this is user error on my part. I think quarantine has me a little nutty right now, especially with my bad pie jokes. Yeah, uh, no, the, the pie joke was great. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, just to sort of underline what Jared just said, right there at the bottom, uh, it used to be our old chart. That looks beautiful, Jared, where the, the, the slice of the pie stands out. That's very cool. Um, it used to be that the legend would, if the legend was large, it would overflow the space. So um, the, the new charting package that uh, Jared's introduced into our product, which is, uh, could you just clarify, Jared, the process of rolling out to all customers now, right? Yes, it is. There's a, a few, uh, we're, we're going through it internally just to iron out any kinks that we see, and it should be rolling out uh, within the next right. week or so. Right. So uh, as a person who put in the original charting, like, a few years ago, this is a significant improvement just in terms of look and feel and usability of the charts. There are no new charts just yet, as in new chart types, but um, it just looks more polished and more professional um, than the charts we used to have before. And do keep in mind, there are still quite a few charts to select from as well. So do feel free to play around with these and, and find something that best suits your needs. All right. Uh, Jared, was there anything else that you wanted to touch on in terms of what's been done with the charts as of now and kind of the direction in which we're going? Uh, not too much right now. I think, as you already mentioned, uh, that we're just at a point where community feedback in terms of your needs and what you're looking for is, is really valued at, at this point while we work on improving them. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Jen, can I add a quick comment for, you know, our... For those of you who've used AppSheet for a while and you saw the editor and it looks different, uh, just a brief comment about that. It's largely at the moment a reskinning of the editor. In other words, everything is, it's the same set of capabilities in the same spots, except that um, the formatting has been changed to reflect more of a, um, uh, I would say, a Google style formatting. So, um, and look and feel. So uh, it's still going through some adjustments before it's done and then uh, available to everybody. Again, that should roll out, I believe, uh, by around the end of the month. So you should be seeing that soon. Excellent. And it looks very clean. Um, it looks great. Uh, Jared, I do have a question for you from the audience. Uh, how can I pivot charts by month with a list of dates? Uh, so that we, I don't believe we have the current capabilities of, of doing that currently. So basically it would require right now for you to uh, basically create a, a virtual column, I believe, and uh, set up the date aggregate there. Um, a little bit more advanced. There's some, uh, there's some community posts around this issue that I can, I can dig up uh, yeah. to respond in more in depth. I think your, your brief version is you do it in two steps. You first define a virtual column that, based on the date, determines the month of the column, month of the of the row. So there's a month function for that. And then you're doing your charting on that virtual column, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you, John. I have another question. Uh, when you have a pie chart on the first view, can we set a different view, such as a bar chart, on the drill down of the pie chart? Not currently. Yeah, not currently. That's That's been a question for a couple of years now. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, just double check. Sure. Oh, so actually, I... on, on that, let me add a little sort of, um, it's just some sort of annotation to that answer. Um, there's a reason we don't have it, and it's a, uh, there's this balance we always get between adding more options in the configuration of the app definition um, and how many people are likely to use it. So, uh, you know, if you have a multi-level um, uh, histogram, for example, or, or an aggregate pie chart, um, you show the first grouping, and then when you click to drill in, you can see the next level of grouping, right? So maybe it's grouped by country and then by state and then by city. Um, and that, I think, was the intent of the question was, can we see uh, the country grouping as a histogram and maybe the state grouping as a pie chart? And we don't allow this. If you start out with a histogram, then as you drill down, it's always a histogram. 
Um, the, in a way, the reason is uh, to enable something like that is more options on the charting configuration. Um, and we try to have options that a relatively large number of people will use. So adding this option would be viable, but then if you proliferate too many options and the product becomes very confusing. So that's, we sort of try to achieve that balance. Um, if a lot of people start asking for something, then you su it suggests a lot of people would use it and we tend to add that. So um, uh, yeah, so I wanna also clarify that not a whole lot of people have asked for that. So it's not like we're likely to add it soon, but we tend to add things very, very sort of tuned into are people asking for them or not. And um, we try not to do things to just small number of people as well. Thank you for that, Praveen. Um, Jared, this, this may be a great question for you. Can we change the name of legend? Uh, because sometimes we want to use other names with different columns. Yeah, again, uh, that is one that we don't currently have the capability of doing. And it's kind of in line with what Praveen was mentioning. That is something we can, uh, we can look into doing, but it, it definitely is additional options that the user uh, can go through. But um, again, this is something that we're looking for, what use cases we want to support moving forward. So uh, this type of thing is, is good to hear that people are looking for. Jen, what's the question to change the values on the legend? Uh, let me go back to the question. Uh, yes, can we change, well, can we change the name of the legend? Because sometimes when we want to use a different name um, with a or use an other name with a different column. Yes, please let me know if I'm misphrasing your question. Yeah. Um, usually the values shown in the legend are things that are defined, they're all just defined by the data, they're not really defined by us. Um, so I think the classic are... example is Go ahead, sorry. Uh, the empty values. Uh, right now, if for an empty value, we show just blank and square brackets. Right. Right. Um, there, there has been an ask in the community before to allow to set that to like work in progress or unknown or something along those lines. That that makes a ton of sense. Now there is um, a good way to solve for this is again virtual columns, because in a virtual column you can write an expression or a formula to uh, to translate from the actual value in the column you want to map into whatever value you want. Um, so there might be a means to do it that way. We'll just have to think about it. It's an interesting idea. And these are great ideas. I'm just going to reinforce to post on our community. Um, as mentioned earlier, we're, we're looking for as much feedback as you all have. So keep uh, use cases and, and information like that coming our way, especially for the thread for today. Uh, okay, so uh, one more question on charts and then we'll, we'll start to proceed a little bit. Uh, is it possible to add a chart in scheduled reports? That I'm actually not sure about. I haven't uh, worked much with scheduled reports yet. I can look into that and follow up, or maybe Praveen knows more. Yeah, this one's come up before. Um, so the way to think about this is that charts are a dynamic component, right? They run inside our application and they're dynamic. And of course, there's gonna be cases where you would like to put a chart into a printed PDF report. There's a function we have for this called Snapshot. And you can uh, look at uh, the documentation in Snapshot, but really what you do is you take a effectively a page or a view of the application itself, and you get a link to that, and you put that within the Snapshot function. And what that does is it effectively gets an image that's a snapshot of the screen of your app. And that image, and images can be put inside reports. So we have uh, our customers who use this feature pretty much say, hey, um, whichever view of the app they want, which might include one or more charts, they can just snapshot it and put it into the uh, PDF report. Um, it's a somewhat expensive feature for us in that, you know, um, it's slow and sort of time consuming because you have to set up a service to run the app, bring it to that state, and then effectively screenshot it. Um, so there's some constraints on, you know, you can't do millions of these. So, um, but it's really useful for the uh, occasional chart you want to do reports. Well, thank you uh, both for, for answering those questions. Uh, all right, so we're going to kind of shift gears from charts into a quick overview on dashboards, but keep your questions coming. We will have more time at the end. Uh, so, oh, and I'm, I'm sorry, one last thing on charts, I should say. Uh, a couple of things to consider. Uh, when you are selecting your chart, 
always make sure you select the appropriate type of chart you want to use to display your data. There are several different options, as we mentioned previously, but try to make sure that you've selected something appropriate um, for visualization. What values do you want on the X and Y axis? Axes, excuse me. Um, that will help determine how your data is oriented or displayed. And then how many individual series on the charts do you want to draw? Um, just a couple of things to consider. We also have great documentation that goes more into depth on charts. Um, we also are available to follow up on the community as well if you have questions. All right, so uh, dashboards. We'll talk about this for just a few moments. Um, these are a staff favorite, which is part of the reason why they come up in office hours a lot. They're really handy, and I really hope more people use this feature um, more often. We have, I think, 15% of all applications incorporate dashboard, um, but it's, it's just a lot of fun. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Uh, so dashboards can display multiple view types, including charts as we just saw, um, list views, etc. cetera. Uh, great option for desktop-based applications, um, which as you can see here, it really fills out the screen very nicely. It does not necessarily feel, um, I would say, well, it does feel like an application. It feels like a web-based application, but it does a great job of filling up the screen. It's very aesthetically pleasing. Um, oh. Apologies there. Uh, it can be interactive. It does require the views to be built from the same table. And we've done a few um, webinars on the interactive component and we can follow up with you all if you have questions on that. And it's a great way to work with and display your charts as you all just saw. Yeah. Right. Um, a couple of comments on that, Jen. Um, the reason you end up with dashboards, typically, if you have applications that involve some folks, they'd say in the field or collecting information. And then there's other folks in the back office who are looking at, you know, aggregate information across all of the data. Uh, for the folks in the back office, uh, the dashboard with, uh, you know, multiple, you know, on a large screen with multiple related views in it is sort of a classic. That's the classic use case. So, right. um, and then you, the interactive part is that you nav when you navigate in one view it navigates in the other views as well. And so that's really, I don't know if you can show it in this one, Jen. I mean, um, when you have an interactive dashboard, the data is linked across them. Yeah, so it's actually when you change it in your previous screen that you were in. Yeah, I don't think this is an interactive based. I don't think the tables okay. are linked. But actually, if you just go back to your uh, the presentation you had, which had the, a GIF on it, uh, this is sort of, I, th I think, just looking at it, there's some collection of companies, they're shown on a map, and when you select individual things on the map, they're shown in detail on the left, all right? Um, but this data is linked together, so when you just click on the different, a specific company on the right, it's automatically selected in the map view as well, and the details are shown. Um, so they're related to each other, and the system is trying to be is smart about how to relate them. So if it's all from the same table, it relates. Sometimes it's tables that are related to other tables just from the data definitions. Um, and it's you can figure that out as well. Uh, so you don't have to do a whole lot to set this up. You just put the views on it and you check, click the checkbox saying it's interactive and the stuff ties together. Sorry, more than you probably wanted to cover, Jan. No, that's great. Um, the, the more advocacy we have around dashboards, I feel like the better. Jared, did you have any commentary on dashboards or working with charts within dashboards? Uh, no, nothing right now, Jen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, one more interesting thing. Uh, we have some folks on our team who spend many years at Tableau, you know, which is a very well-known you know, uh, analytics and charting <laughs> dashboarding company. Uh, and one of the interesting things is dashboards are often, you know, in, Classically, they tend to be read-only. So you look at it, um, and then you update your data someplace else. Uh, with an app sheet dashboard, you can actually combine the two things. You can have this dashboard here, but actually, you know what? If some data needs to be changed in one of the entries, you can change it dynamically because it's just an application. It happens to have some charts, and it also happens to have some data that can be changed. Um, so it's really good for those uh, merge scenarios as well. Excellent. Yeah, I think the Tableau thing is important to call out. Um, Thierry mentioned this in our, our last office hours. He's our director of engineering, I think is his title now. Um, he has a long history with Tableau and he's very passionate about charts, especially charts within dashboards. So you'll hear us talk about charts a lot. You'll see him talk about charts a lot as well. So um, thank you for that additional uh, information there, Praveen. All right. All right, we're gonna talk about white labeling applications. Uh, I'm going to give a disclaimer here. 
Um, we've received a lot of questions on this. I, we are going to do our best to address some of the broader based questions. Um, I spent a great deal of time interviewing the engineer who has built a lot of this um, to make sure that I could help answer some of these. And we have Praveen and Jared here too to help. So um, we're gonna dig into this and, and help as many as you can uh, resolve some of the questions that you have. All right, so what is white labeling? Uh, white labeling allows you to establish your own branding with native versions of your applications. Uh, it is available on both Android and iOS, but we'll touch on that in just a moment. Um, we do provide the distribution for uh, your application to both Android and iOS uh, quite easily, but there's an asterisk to that. Uh, it is This particular feature is available on Publisher and a few of our secured plans. Uh, Publisher is that $50 plan that we offer um, secured. I believe that's based on licensing, if I remember correctly. Praveen, correct me if I'm wrong with that. Uh, typically, yeah, yeah, that's for that's a uh, meant for public apps which don't require sign-in. Right. Um, so this is an this next point we're about to make is an important disclaimer. Um, typically, applications that are white labeled that are pushed to the store, you do not want to um, have secure sign-in for since it's in a public store. Um, an important note on that as well, and one of the questions we receive a lot is how to monetize your application. Uh, we we there is not currently a way to manage subscriptions with your end user in your application uh, i think that's an important point to make and so i'm going to say it again there's not currently a way to manage subscriptions for your applications for your end users um so and i think that answers a couple of questions on the board as well so you can create an application you can white label it you can upload it to the google play or the ios store um, but we cannot help you monetize it. Um, Praveen, is there anything you'd like to add to that comment right there? <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's different kinds of apps that people put in app stores. Um, one common class of apps is a consumer app, let's say a game, right? Um, we don't build, you don't build games on AppSheet. Yeah, or maybe you could, maybe it's a couple of people who try it, but you know, that's, it's not a platform that you do something like that. Um, then there's another class of apps which are just information kind of apps who say, hey, I've got a big event coming, uh, you know, like in Seattle, typically in the summers, we have like a big, you know, this thing called Sea Fair, which is a bunch of water, you know, um, craft doing stuff, and there's a three-day schedule. So sometimes public events want to have a public app that just has their calendar and agenda and so on. That's something you could build an app sheet, and, you know, uh, people do that. And you could want to put that in an app store. So uh, that's a, a reason to have your own uh, native white labeled app. Um, there's a third class of apps, which is uh, sort of company internal apps. You use it within with your team, with your organization, with your suppliers. Um, for that kind of app, it rarely makes sense to put it in an app store because you know what? You've got a few hundred people using it, maybe a thousand people using it. They all work in your organization. Um, you don't need... Uh, uh, your own custom app in the app store for this app sheet takes care of that automatically this is 90 i don't know more than 95 percent of our users yeah right so they never have to worry about this but there's a fourth category also let's say you're building an app your bank and you need to build an app for all your customers to occasionally check some information right. so there is a case where there's businesses that need an app for their customers but there's a largest number of their customers they might need to sign in um, so that's a use, sensible case too, and you might want to have your own branded app in the app store to do that. So white labeling allows you to do that. Those customers do sign in, but who will be allowed to sign in, who not? There's nuance there. All the same security mechanisms of app sheets still apply. In other words, you can have an explicit list of users who are allowed to use the app. You can connect it to a domain authentication system and members of a particular group can access it. So there's a number of different ways, all the standard access control mechanisms still work. Um, now to monetization, typically it's two ways to monetize something. You know, you either monetize through users subscribing to stuff, and we don't have any particular mechanism to let you do that. Um, the other very common way of monetization in, in mobile apps is through advertising. And um, we don't support that either. Uh, mainly because advertising is really relevant for free apps that are consumer facing, and that's not what we're focused on. It's not a business we're uh, trying to enable. 
Um, the ask has come up a few times, but we haven't, and we have no particular plans in the short term to enable, you know, AdMob or other mobile monetization packages. iOS, Android, each of them have their own, and we do not um, embed that into our platform. Right. Thank you, Praveen. That's that's really, um, I think, important. Helps clarify uh, a few questions that our, our creators had. Um, so please feel free to respond with questions, folks, if you have them on either the community or in the question box, and we'll answer additional. But Praveen, I think that was a great succinct way to talk about white labeling. Um, just a, a couple more items to follow up on. Um, so one con to consider, and Praveen, you might need to clarify this for me um, a little bit as well, or for our audience as well, is in terms of how we push updates to our product, um, it does tend to, it's a little more difficult in terms of how it updates to the native applications that you're building with white labeling. It's, there, it goes through, an, to put it in a layman's sense, it goes through essentially an extra step. Uh, we, Typically, if it's anything drastic, we typically notify the user beforehand, um, but it, it can be a little difficult to push those updates. Um, also, some of the updates would cause you to need to push a new packet to one of the stores. Apple has a few more barriers of entry to get your application in their store. Um, Android, we find, is typically a little bit more successful when it comes down to it. Um, some of the additional pros, though, to mention, um, if you do not make changes in your editor, you do not, or excuse me, if you make changes in your editor, um, you do not need to resubmit your packets to the various stores. Um, that, that's something that goes through quite easily with one except, or with two exceptions, excuse me, branding and logo chase, changes. And that's because that's what's visible in the store. Um, they rely on that and that would require a new packet to be pushed. Uh, Praveen or Jared, anything to add to those last two remarks? Jared says something you wanted to any further refinement you wanted to add? No, that all sounds good. Yeah. Um, I, one way to think about this is um, when you run an app, an app sheet app on your um, on your mobile device, um, there's actually a thin um, every app, uh, every regular app you have on your phone is uh, some kind of executable package. It's some binary program, right? And um, you know, so if your your email application is some binary program like your calendar and so on, uh, but the app sheet app that you build most of the time doesn't produce its own binary program because if you produce that binary package, somehow it has to get to your phone, and the only path to get there is by putting it into an app store and then somebody downloading it, all right? And that's a tedious and painful path. It takes time. It takes effort. Yeah. Um, so. The way most app sheet apps run is it bypasses this this whole process. There's already a, a binary package which is built by us and is already available in the app stores. And you download it once onto your on your phones, the very first time you run an application. And then every app that you build in our platform is actually just hosted inside it. It appears to you that you're running your auto capture app or your you know vehicle inspection app and so on, but each of them is just hosted inside this one host, which is the binary package we built. That's the way it works. The binary package is it takes time to update. So um, if there's a bug in it or an update in it that we need to make, it takes weeks to do because it has to go through the app stores. They have to approve it. It has to get rolled out to everybody. But changes you make in the definition of your app itself, the auto capture, vehicle inspection, and so on, they roll out instantly. They roll out in every sync, right? So um, that's why it's... If one way or the other, the changes you make in your app almost always go out instantly to your users. Now, if there are changes in that binary package wrapper and you have chosen to build your own white label native app, you then become responsible for pushing that through the app stores. And that is, um, there's a cost, there's a benefit to having your own application, which is you get your own branding. Um, it looks like your own thing. It's not app sheet, but um, the cost is, some changes are tedious. They have to go through approval processes. And as Jen mentioned, um, the iTunes store, which is Apple's uh, app store, is uh, so can be particularly difficult in going through some of those approval processes at times. Well, thank you um, for that additional commentary, Praveen. Uh, so I have one more question I want to touch on in terms of pricing for 
users who are interested in white labeling apps and as it pertains to subscriptions, um, because this is kind of a reiteration of, of several questions we've received around this. Um, so they're saying I have an app that would cost $10 for one month. Couldn't that be charged via Apple, but user is controlled um, by allowed emails? So um, Bob, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, you're probably using one of our plans that's $10 a month um, per user. Perhaps a publisher pro plan or a publisher plan would be a better option for you. Um, I'm not quite certain how many users you're trying to get to, but to reiterate an earlier point, Apple, um, so we can't help you manage your, or we're not currently able to help you manage your subscriptions right now for your applications. Um, in terms of who you allow to use your application, as Praveen mentioned just a few moments ago, you can still set certain parameters in from a security standpoint in terms of who can access your application. Um, so do keep that in mind as well. Uh, yeah. Now, I might be, I'm not 100% sure this is the case, but I think uh, when you build your application, you can price it at whatever price you want. Right? This is really between you and the App Store. So I think you can take your application, your, your native white labeled app and decide to price it at whatever price. And then your customer, whoever tries to install the app would pay that to Apple and Apple keeps its card and pays it the rest to you. Um, and after that, there's a question of how does that user get access to your app? You know, your app, for example, could be completely quote unquote public. Um, we, we don't have a good mechanism for you to tie that customer's purchase with AppSheet to um, uh, assign it in your system. I think that may be hard, I think at the heart of your question, Bob. Um, it just sort of re relates back to there's not been enough people pushing for this, for it to become a business priority for us, but why don't we go back, if you don't mind, if this is an ask that you can flag as a feature request in a community, um, if there's enough interest in that, we look at it. Uh, the real reason we haven't is over the years we've been in existence, um, most of our customers have been more in the sort of business internal apps domain rather than right. trying to monetize an app in the consumer space. Right, I agree. I think that's an important point uh, to mention as well. Our uh, immediate needs have, have been towards driving um, businesses and individuals to be successful in their day to day. Um, but yes, please post that in the feature request category in the community and and you know, the more cloud that gets behind it, we can certainly start to look into it. Um, Bob says he will do. There we go. All right, so let's move on. Um, oh, so really quickly, I should probably show you where, if you're interested in white labeling, you can go ahead and white label your application. So uh, again, back in the editor, if you go to manage, um, under the section deploy, you'll see this tab here called white label. Click on this, super simple. You would click this button and give it a few seconds. And there you go. So then you would follow up with Android or for iOS. Right. And, yeah, and the Android one's easy and the iOS one is not for the faint of heart. That is a great way of phrasing it, Praveen. Um, as, as someone who, who I think all of us actually have probably had a lot of experience trying to get applications into the um, Apple Store outside of AppSheet um, related white labeling apps, and it's, it's a chore. Um, it's a chore. I did it a lot with my previous company, and it's, it's quite a chore. Um, all right, so we're going to turn that back off. And... It'll reload. There you go. And it's back to its default setting. All right. So really, again, it's a really quickly or very easy click of a button. Just make sure you have the appropriate plan that goes with it. Make sure your application is designed for it. And we can provide some additional resources um, to discuss a little bit more um, the parameters for working with white labeling at, at greater depth. Um, and again, if you have more questions related to pricing and things like that, please feel free to let us know on the, the community forum post. Oop. All right, um, so Q&A time. Let's follow up with a few additional questions. Um, Jared, have we missed anything that you wanted to touch on so far in terms of charts, white labeling, dashboards, anything like that? No, I think we've covered it all. Okay. Um, 
All right, so uh, this question's from Jonathan. Could you comment on having to reprovision iOS apps annually? Um, I'm not sure what exactly, uh, could you clarify the reprovisioning piece? I'm not sure what you mean by that, but. Uh... Yes, so, so Jonathan stated it's his understanding this is a requirement of iOS apps. Um, but his question is, could you comment on having to reprovision iOS apps annually? Yeah, I don't have enough context for this one. Can I take that one offline with you, Jonathan, and we'll just find out more about that and get that back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, uh, question from Grant. How will we know when we need to update our white label apps? Uh, usually we tell you. Um, yes. It's it's relatively rare, but a good example would be, you know, Apple came out with this new phone that had a notch at the top. And because it had a notch at the top, it messes with, you have to do um, some extra work in the uh, native package uh, to handle that and lay that out correctly. And um, for the first couple of months, we in fact we hadn't, then we'd roll out an update for that. But then we have to basically inform you that you need to rebuild your white label package and then re resubmit it for as an update to the um, app stores. And so, yeah, we try to make this as infrequent as possible because it's such a burden for, mostly for for you, for our customers to have to go through that again. Uh, uh, for what it's worth, I would love for, you know, almost nobody to use the, the native white labeling because that's the least friction for us and for you. If you can just use the default, what comes out of the box with us. It's just that there are cases where somebody has a custom a specific need for the white labeling, but you take you're you're taking on this knowledge that um, you will pay a uh, you'll pay a recurring cost going forward, which is um, the maintenance, you know, the nurture, care, and feeding of this uh, native application going forward. Right, that's a that's all really good um, points, Praveen. Thank you for that. Uh, all right, so I kind of a commentary on charts for you, Jared. Uh, a card chart, or excuse me, a card type chart would be awesome. Do you have that in the pipeline? I'm not sure exactly what is meant by a card type chart. Um, so maybe I think this was asked by James. Uh, yes. if maybe ex just expound on that a little bit. And uh, yeah, it might be, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, hey, Jared, do you have a card chart up your sleeve? <laughs> <laughs> oh, quarantine's making us all a little naughty. Uh, that was a great pun, Praveen, by the way. Jared, I hope you're ready for more, more chart-related puns, especially around pies and magic. Oh, yeah, keep uh, them coming. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me make sure I'm understanding this correctly before I ask this. Does the charge me do it? I'm trying to set a high bar for the charts. Oh man, Praveen. Okay. Koichi, I'm gonna try, let's try to tackle this question. Um, on the new chart, how do you align the items, names, not legion? Uh, for instance, we have a bunch of dates on the X axis. It is currently not visible as, it is currently not visible as they are overwrapping. If we render the same amount of dates on that chart, I assume um, I assume some remarkable dates, such as the first date of each month, would be displayed while other dates are hidden. Uh, yeah, I think I know what's happening. So, um, so basically, there's a, there's a couple things. One is currently the way charts render. If you have a lot of dates on the x-axis, for example, they'll they'll start overlapping and you won't be able to read them. So there'll be some updates coming that basically prunes the labels and removes them, so that way a select few remain visible. Uh, moving uh, sometime in the future, we're going to work on a way uh, for you to basically zoom in on the data so that you can see the labels clearly. Um, so basically, it's just currently the way it's set up now. The uh, yeah, the amount of data is fixed to the width of the display. So if you have a million labels, there's just there's just not a way to uh, to see them all clearly. But we're working on some some ways to to enable that. 
Yeah, there's a just to add to that, there's a big reveal there, <laughs> in that um, it, today's charting is, as Jared said, pretty fixed. Um, the charts themselves are not very interactive beyond, I think you can enable or disable any particular data line in the chart, but um, beyond that, they're not very interactive. But Jared's been doing some work and you know we've seen some early stuff of that inside, which lets you be more interactive in your, um, lets the user of the application be more interactive as they explore the chart. Uh, and an example of that is to sort of uh, scroll into subsets of the chart, for example. So. Um, it's a pretty exciting stuff uh, that Jared sort of previewed. It's still a little ways away from being ready to um, roll out to everybody, but um, uh, the main thing we wanted to flag here is after years of not, well, a couple of years of not really investing enough in the charts, uh, we now have uh, uh, the resources and skilled engineers like Jared uh, applying their energies at improving it. Yeah, that's going to make a lot of people very, very happy. So Jared, uh, you're about to become a celebrity. Watch out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> come true. Um, all right, so I've got a couple questions around working with Google Data Studio. Um, the question is, are there any plans to somehow integrate Google Data Studio or its features with AppSheet in any way? And I think I know the answer to this, but Praveen, I'm going to pass this one to you. I think the, the Google official answer is no comment, but um, I'm being a good corporate citizen, but... Um, <laughs> I think I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. It's sort of more like, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, we would love to have AppSheet more integrated with uh, a number of Google products and Data Studio is obviously one of them. Um, but these sort of cross things take some time. And so we, um, we see the value in integrating with it. And, um, and it's not the only one. We'd see the value in integrating with Firebase. We see the value in integrating with a number of other products. Um, it just takes some time to do. We're just about gotten settled in here at Google and I've got to you know, figure out how things work and um, getting our systems running and all of that stuff. Um, so uh, more integrations should be in the future, but I, I, it's too early to provide specifics. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, so this, this is a question I see pretty often. Are we going to get a NAT chart anytime soon? So I haven't looked into Gantt charts yet. Um, that is something that we'd have to look into. Yeah. Theory very much wants to have Gantt charts. It's obviously so valuable for the entire class of project planning applications, among others. But um, yeah, we have a shot at doing it now. I mean, basically, there was no shot at doing it as long as we were on the old charting package. It just didn't support it, and there's no way we could build on it. We're now in a more, you know, Jared has moved us to a more modern charting package, so it opens up opportunity. All right, um, we got a couple more minutes. So I've got a question on calendar colors. Uh, it's a little bit outside the scope for today, but let's see if we can tackle this one. Um, is it possible to select the colors in a calendar appointment based on a tag? Right now they are random different colors. I would like to be able to choose the color for each of about six different categories. Thanks. Yeah. Um... I don't remember off the top of my head, but um, we need to have some consistency in coloring across um, a variety of different presentations, whether it's calendars, maps, charts, right? Because if you're going to look at an item that's listen, something, you know, an order just uh, open and the category open should have the same color, whether you show it in a chart or something else. Um, we have a couple of mechanisms for this, but the sort of a generic mechanism is one called formatting rules, which assign colors to things based on the data values. And so those colors should be consistently used everywhere, but they're not yet respected right, I think, in calendar views, because when we built it, we first initially rolled it out, we didn't have the format rule support, and I don't think we've come back and added it correct. So um, that's a sort of an inconsistency, and we, we have that on our agenda to fix. Okay, excellent. What we won't do is have a very custom thing, just one off a calendar, but it will more be like a, a consistency thing across the product. Thank you for that, Praveen. Uh, let's see, let's do one, all right, let's one, maybe two more. Uh, so this is a great, just kind of a, a foundational question. If you have an existing spreadsheet that is connected to your app, 
are you only able to use one data source without a paid account? Um, so a data source, you, you can have many spreadsheets, different tables in your app or in multiple apps. So data source is more something like are you connected to a SQL system or are you connected to a Salesforce system and so on. Those are your data sources. Um, but if Google, let's say Google Drive is your uh, where you, how you created your account, you may have many spreadsheets and you can include many of them in the same app or in multiple apps. So um, absolutely you should. Um, and that's got nothing to do with whether the account is paid for or not. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, all right, so one more, um, this is kind of a, a comment for you, Jared. Um, Grant, who's a very active member of our community, and Praveen, I have a feeling you're going to know what I'm about to say. Um, he's requesting hierarchy <laughs> drill, drillable-based views. Um, I know you're focusing on charts, but uh, something to keep in mind. I know Grant is a, a big advocate for this. So Grant, um, there's your shout out for, <laughs> for that particular view type. Uh, hierarchical, hierarchical views. Yes, I, I wake up in a cold sweat sometimes <laughs> in a nightmare because Grant asked me for hierarchical views so many times and I've never had something useful to say in response. So, <laughs> um, so we'll have the same nightmare again tonight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ho hopefully not, Praveen. You need to rest. We need you to build things. Uh, all right. So that's it for questions we have time for for right now. Uh, please continue to post on the forum. We'll do our best to answer these as quickly as possible. And for those that of you, uh, those of you that have dropped questions in the chat box, I'll try to follow up on the forum for you as well. All right. So next steps for all of you folks: start using these features. Um, I will add that please provide your feedback specifically on charts. Um, we will make this a wonderful feature based on your feedback. And this is one of those moments: if you don't say something, you might not get to see it. So highly encourage you all to engage and provide your feedback um, and help us improve the products. Uh, and with that, happy app building to you all. Um, Jared and Praveen, thank you for joining today and providing um, some clarity and information. Did either of you have any parting words you'd like to share with our audience today? Thank you, uh, Jen, and uh, I'm, thank you for everyone who attended. Thank you, Jen. Happy app building sounds like uh, great parting words. Excellent. Well, thank you both again for joining and thank all of you for attending today. Uh, we will be posting a recording in the forum on this thread. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you all online. Thanks so much.